Just wanted to welcome everybody here to this Invasive Strike Force Surveyor Training for Intermediate Species. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Brent Boscarino. I am the Invasive Species Citizen Science Program Coordinator with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, and just really excited to have everybody here tonight to uh, learn about some less common emerging species. We have some new intermediate surveyors this year and then some veterans. So we've got a good mix of people, excited to have you and to take on this additional challenge. So just as a really quick review, why are we here? Why are we all here together and, and sharing in this? Well, it's because we're part of the invasive strike force. And that is a, that is a combined effort from the Lower Hudson Prism or Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management and we are hosted by the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And, you know, in 2011, we began this effort to basically protect the natural areas that we treasure and love to be out and explore and uh, protect it from the threat of invasive species and to protect that native habitat and ecosystems that we love through the power of citizen science. And what we are here primarily to do is to learn about the plants on our intermediate list. And that is to collect information about which of those plants there are, where they're found in Northern New Jersey in New York State, so that we can report it and begin to map their distribution. Because we use that information from you guys to get out there, learn about what it is. I mean, we're a really small staff here at the Trail Conference and we can't do it all. And we need your help. And that's why you guys are so amazing as volunteers to go out and do this survey work for us so that we can put it into our mapping systems, then kind of all get together um, as a prism. Remember we are, the prism itself is over 72 partner, like around 70 partner organizations. And we, so we can make appropriate management decisions from that map. So just remember your data is being used um, and it's going, goes into our, our, our mapping system. Just for, for example, this is a look at Scunamonk Skate Park, a lot of different surveys together. And we can use the data that you're returning to us to you know, see where, where invasives are. You know, you've got this uh, pretty pristine area and most of Scunamonk, but there's certainly some areas that we can, we can put some management to good use and design some volunteer removal days or get our crew out there to actually to do something about it, not just report it. And that's what the third goal of the invasive strike force is, right? We have a seasonal crew. We're excited to say that our AmeriCorps crew is now here and has begun just a couple of days ago and they are totally ready to go. We set these projects a year in advance. And a lot of what we decide to work on as a seasonal crew um, and as, a, as our invasive strike force crew is based on the surveys that, that we have coming back. And then for all other things, you know, a lot of grassroots movements from wonderful volunteers like you to organize volunteer removal events. Uh, we happen to have a lot in, uh, around, in and around Old Oak Croton, Croton Aqueduct this year um, and in past years, but like all throughout Northern New Jersey, New York State. Lots of action coming from this survey work that you guys are doing. And the reason why we're focused on intermediate species and why the work that you're doing at this higher level, not just the standard species that, that you're used to doing, is because you know um, early detection and rapid response is absolutely critical. I don't know if you guys have seen this map before, but essentially the way that the invasion curve works is that when you first find a species and it's in low abundance and it's just starting to get into an area, that's when like that early window of early detection and rapid response is so critical. And the work that we're doing today to learn about the, a lot of the species on our ISF intermediate list is in that window of opportunity. These are less common invasive species that are just say moving, a lot of them move in from the south and kind of make their way north. And so this is an opportunity to really kind of find these less common ones in our natural areas and get them before they become big problems. So if you've worked with us in the past on the standard species list, you're mainly looking at species that are, have, are widespread, they're abundant, and long-term control and population suppression. Um, it, it's, if you can do it very locally and you can make those management decisions to be like, oh, okay, well, this common invasive species um, is in an otherwise pristine area or in a critical habitat and we wanna work on it. But the beauty of working with the intermediate species and helping to find these is that these are just emerging in our region and we can really make a difference right now to kind of tackle these. And that's where our crew, um, uh, main, their main priorities are. So taking this new level that you're taking and taking on this challenge to go in and find these, uh, these less common ones is not only more challenging and kind of exciting because it's more like 
scavenger hunty or whatever, but um, it also really kind of directly um, directly lays in to what our seasonal crews, our priorities are and what our priority is in the region. So uh, kudos to you for taking on this extra challenge. So let's dive right into our first couple of invasive species. We've got a lot to cover tonight and I got a lot of good field videos. So, um, I'm, you know, hopefully it's gonna feel like you're there with me and part of that process on a nature walk at seven o'clock, you know, even though we're all looking at each other on a computer screen. So let's get going. The first of our species that we're gonna be covering is called common buckthorn. It's a small deciduous tree, although it, you know a lot of times it's gonna look like a shrub, but it can grow like anywhere between six and 18 feet. And remember the designation of a tree is kind of arbitrary. A tree just usually has a single trunk and can grow taller than 13 feet. So a lot of times buckthorn is gonna be categorized as a tree, even though it can have multiple stems as well. I'm gonna go over in this field ID video, some of its common characteristics, but leaf shape is a really key one. Um, you're going to notice that the three curving veins towards the point of that kind of a tooth margin on it. And what's really kind of unique and, and different about buckthorn are its nearly opposite leaves. Look at this picture here. Uh, truly opposite is exactly 180 off of one another where the leaves are coming out. But you see how they're little like sub opposite it's called. So that's something to be on the lookout for as well. So I'm going to get right into the field ID video. And for any of you who participate in our EcoQuest challenge, you'll have seen this before because it was a focal species for us in the fall. But I'm going to now play a video for you um, from that challenge. So this was taken in the fall, but a lot of the same characteristics will apply. So I'm going to let this play through. And if you haven't, um, just so you're aware, when this plays over Zoom, it might be a little bit jumpy and spotty. But as I sort of like zoom in, the camera will stabilize a bit and the voice coming through is going to be a little bit more tinnier than it is by me coming through live. But I'll interject at times when I have something to point out in the video. So enjoy. We're going to let this play a little bit. From some other lookalikes. So the first thing I want to note about buckthorn leaves. So um, is that the outside margins of buckthorn, you see how they're nice and two. So they have certainly have like a serrated edge to them. Also, those veins that we're seeing here in this leaf, let's take a closer look at those. There's about three. Or and remember, by veins, that's sort of like the blood vessels of the plant that's delivering nutrients to the leaves. So here you got one, two, three that are curving. And this is sort of the midrib here. That is very, very crucial to look for those three to five sometimes, but mostly three curving veins. Or so, three to five usually paired veins that are arcing towards the tip of buckthorn leaves so that is one distinguishing feature is these like these tooth leaves and also the three pairs of uh three to five pairs of primary veins that are arcing towards the middle the other big thing that uh, to notice about buckthorn if you take a look at the twig of buckthorn let's take a closer look at that you see this terminal bud that i am oh I'm holding in my hand here. I don't know what happened there. Well, there is a big thorn projection that's coming out of the edge. So they're not found on all of the branches, but that's definitely one thing to be on the lookout for are these like little thorny projections that you'll find at the edge. You see this little point that's coming out there? Again, it depends on if it's been pruned or trimmed uh, recently, but you might see that on some of the branches if you want to look, look closer. And here's kind of a cool thing as to why it's named buckthorn. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Edge of buckthorn twigs right between the terminal buds that extend out. So the, the part where it's still growing. The reason why it's called buckthorn, I learned interestingly, is that it kind of looks like deer tracks. See the buds there almost look like deer tracks you might see in the snow or mud at this time of year. So that's just another kind of cool feature about buckthorn. But again, it's out competing a lot of our natives, uh, looking for that greenish color. Uh, another interesting feature about buckthorn is that it starts out as a shrub, so multi-stemmed. But you can see that this one that I'm looking at here can actually grow to be quite tall. See all that green in the background? This is about a, um, I'd say about a, uh, I don't know, like 16 foot tall, um, you know, almost growing like a tree at this point. So it can be characterized as a tree with one primary trunk. But when it's younger, you'll start to see that it's got um, multiple trunks. Let's zoom in on what that trunk looks like. Um, you can see these leaves like even more clearly here. Remember those uh, three pairs 
um, you know, very obvious veins that are curving towards the tip of this tooth margins. But here's a look at like the bark of this. So the younger buckthorn will be a little more grayer, but the and I'm going to show you in a second what that grayer younger one looks like. But look at like like the, this is like a very scaly kind of look to this. They'll have these raised lenticels versus as it gets older, it's, it becomes even bumpier, right? And almost like a kind of appealing sort of bark to it, but but definitely more like bumpy, um, you know, more aged look to it than some of the younger saplings uh, that you might see of buckthorn that's growing. So, And you'll notice just, I, I recorded this in the fall. You notice how like, this is the only thing that's green. Everything around it, like there's an oak tree right by it. There's no leaves on it. And this gives it that competitive advantage, much longer growing season, right? As an invasive. That gives a distinct advantage over the natives. So these are some of the key features. Um, in a second, I will show you what the berries look like, which are very persistent throughout the winter. Um, and just another feature that you could be looking for in addition to the ones that we just covered. Before we move on to the berries of buckthorn, I did want to show you some of the differences or what a younger version of buckthorn looks like. So um, as we zoom into this here, you'll see that there are these raised bumps or lenticels that are found on a younger buckthorn, uh, but it's not quite doesn't have that a Okay, so just remember that lenticels are used for gas exchange in plants to help like with gas exchange. Um, so again, those that those bumps are very clear on the younger uh, on the younger buckthorn. It's like really rough appearance of an older uh, common buckthorn that uh, we saw previous in this video. There's one other feature about buckthorn that is actually makes it really obvious um, in the field and something to definitely be looking for. So let's take a look at this branch here. You'll notice that these leaves here, you see how they're coming off of each other, like very very close to oppositely. Um, on this branch, but they're just slightly offset. We call that sub opposite or just. And I had mentioned that earlier. And just remember, there's another like plant ID review. Do you see how the buds are like right at the base of that leaf? That mean that makes it a simple leaf, not compounds, right? So these are just like term reviews. It's not it. quite opposite of one another, but very, very close. And that is actually a really unique ID feature and something that I know that I am on the lookout for when I'm looking for buckthorn. So tooth margins um, and this almost like almost opposite or nearly opposite appearance to how that they are arranged and you can really see that spike or those that thorn coming out there too so definitely be on the lookout for all see of these right features there. whether young or old common buckthorn in our areas um, natural areas here's a look at the black bunched berries of common buckthorn a lot of bees for you there um, you can see if we come in a little bit closer to what these berries look like they're rounded uh black a little bit of a dimple on the bottom you can see the the berry stains on my fingers there um another way we know that we are looking at buckthorn is if we look at the end you see that that thorn like that projection at the end that kind of like spear in between the terminal buds that's a really good look at it so essentially you're going to get these darker berries but you're not going to see that probably for most of the survey season unless it persists over winter. And that's sometimes a good, a good thing to be on the lookout for if you wanted to confirm that you were looking at buckthorn. Even though the berries won't come out till later in the year, sometimes they last throughout the winter and they may be still be on the tree. So that's a good look at what common buckthorn is. There's lots of different um, things that you could to look for to really kind of confirm what it is that you're seeing. So you got a lot of things in your in your toolkit to kind of pull from there. And uh, Seek and iNaturalist is very good at identifying buckthorn, just for the record. Um, the only other thing you want to compare it with is that there are various buckthorns in our environment, or they're much, much more rare. The only one that is less rare is unfortunately another invasive one. It's called uh, glossy buckthorn. And the difference between it, if you were paying attention, remember how a common buckthorn has three arcing veins? Look how many more that glossy buckthorn has. So many more secondary veins, and it also has a smooth margin, unlike common buckthorn, which has the tooth margins. So that's really the only other uh, thing you may confuse it with. Uh, and, and again, it, worst comes to worst, you post uh, as another uh, invasive buckthorn, right? Okay. On to species number two, and that is European, this has many different names, European alder, black alder, I've also seen common alder, so it's Ulnus glutinosa, 
And that's how it's going to appear on iNaturalist as well. And that's a deciduous medium tree. And again, you know, it can it, it can sometimes have multiple stems. We're defining tree as just being can be really, really tall, usually single trunk, but not always. It just means that it's tall. So it can grow like a tree, but also like a shrub. Um, and here, as you're going to see in the video, we are looking for a very distinctive notch that's on the end of the leaf. Um, the other thing, and we also just featured this in an EcoQuest, and I'm going to show you in the video, it's usually found near water. And the other main thing that's really going to key you in on whether you're looking at an alder is, is it by water and does it have the presence of catkins, which are its reproductive um, structures, and as both female and male. So I'm just going to dive like right into the field ID video. This is again from another EcoQuest for those of you who, are, who participate in our EcoQuest challenges. Um, this is a video that I just recently took for our water walk challenge. I always try to, I, sometimes I star my kids, so that's my son Wynn in the background, skimming stone. <laughs> anyway, here we go. This is uh, common black or European alder. Projects through iNaturalist. Here's a look at a whole stand of our first EcoQuest challenge species called black or European alder. All around me here, this is an abandoned wetland here that was kind of converted during development in this area. And you can see that it can grow as a multi-stemmed, almost like shrub-like fashion, even though it can get pretty tall. But typically it's gonna grow as straight up, as a very skinny tree. So you see how this is a single trunk and this one is super tall, like it went straight up. Tree. One of the hallmark features of black alder are these bumpy lenticels on the trunk and the branches itself. So lenticels are these pores that allow for gas exchange between the tree or plant itself and its outside environment. You can see that it's studded with all of these white bumps. You can see the scale of that with my thumb here. As I follow this tree up, you can see that they can be pretty tall. So, you know, a lot of these trees around me here are about 30 feet in height. So looking straight up into the sky here, they can get pretty tall. I wanted to also look at this one that's kind of leaning over here. You'll notice that as we follow this, those lenticels can... I know it's probably making you a little seasick from the jumping, so I'll pause every once in a while. But when I get in closer, it should it should help with the transition. ...continue uh, along the trunk. But another hallmark feature that I want to point out about it is that it is monoecious, meaning that its male and female uh, structures are found on the same uh, plant itself. And I So that's kind of neat. Mono meaning one right? And he's just meaning like a gender, right? So it like on one plant, you're going to get male and female parts. And that is really key. And the parts are called catkins. And I'm going to show that in a second. And these for black alder are called catkins. So this is the flowering spike uh, or the female flowering. The other thing I want you to know, and I, I think I say it later in the video, but just in case I don't, to tell common alder from uh, other types of alders, it has a it has a longer way to go between the main cone of the female uh, of the female catkin. You see how there's like a bit of a stem there coming out from the main branch. That's going to be key for you. Spring spike, the called catkins. They almost have like a pine cone like look to them. You can notice that they're about the size of my thumbnail. So that's what the females will. will uh, uh, flowering spikes will look like but you can also see within this same tree itself you'll also see the male catkins that are that are on this plant as well They're i want to pause it there so you can get a good look it's nice and elongated a couple inches long and kind of uh, i don't know like fluffy or something they're very long and kind of skinny uh, so again, looking at my uh, hand for a frame of reference here, there may be a couple inches long and very, very narrow, right? And all throughout this tree here, you'll see the, that the male and female catkins are found on that same, on these same branches and on the same uh, tree. So uh, you'll also notice that black alder has an alternating um branching structure to it so again here would be a branch coming off there then alternating there so meaning that each of these uh you know little twigs and stuff that are coming off the main stem are coming off alternate they're not opposite of one another like coming out at 180 degrees from each other so these are all features to be on the lookout for for that to make sure that you are looking at black alder look for the presence of those catkins and the bumpy lenticels all along its length of its trunk
I wish I could tell you that the bumpy lenticels and the presence of the catkins was enough to get a firm ID, but there's a couple more things to be on the lookout for to know for sure that you are looking at black alder. So even though you're not going to be able to see the leaves at this time of year, these are some images from that same stand that I took a little bit later in the spring of last year. And you notice that black alder. So this is what you're going to see right about now is it's kind of lighter green and you're going to see a notch at the end. That's that's key that you have to look for that notch. Otherwise, you may confuse it with something else. So that that's really, really important to look for that notch as a very distinctive notch that's at the end of some of its leaves. This is actually, this image was from that same grove. You see that little notch there at the end and in this picture here? Well, a lot of the other lookalikes, a lot of the native alders do not have that. They'll have pointy ends to it. The other thing to uh, be mindful of is that the catkins on the invasive alders tend to have be on longer stalks. You see how this coming off the main branch there has a longer stalk and these are very extended. If you look at a lookalike, like native speckled alder, the leaf tips on that are gonna be very pointed versus the previous one as we saw that little notch at the end there. Also the speckled alder, it's cones or, you know, it's uh, cat female catkins are on shorter stalks. They're hugging that branch a little bit closer. So, all right. So those are the main features of the difference. Someone was actually asking about speckled alder. That's actually a native. And so it's okay to have, um, and it's got a point at the end very clearly, right? It does not have a notch. And you see how the, the cones are, they're hugging the stalk a little bit more. So that's how to tell it apart from, from a native, some of the native alders. Um, I am going to go back to the PowerPoint slide now. And the only other thing that I want, want to note about that is that because it grows near water, it could have like really, really long and extended kind of like almost, uh, you know, ever seen a fantasy movie or something, fantasy movie looking trees, like with long, like <laughs> surface roots like this, you know, kind of like ants or something walking across the uh, middle earth or something. I don't know. So uh, any, that's just another thing to, to be on the lookout for. We mentioned uh, speckled alder as being different. Just look for the apex as a point. Otherwise, um, you're looking at common alder, European black alder, the invasive. All right, that's it for the trees, guys. So let's move on to the shrubs. The first of the shrubs, actually, there's going to be two here. So I'm going to do a classification here of viburnums. Now, viburnums are, they're very prevalent in the environment, but there are so many different varieties. And I'm sure if you're like a gardener type, you probably have viburnums on your property. Some of them are native, some of them are not. So we're going to try to tease that apart right now. So the first thing we really need to do is just get a general sense for what makes a viburnum a viburnum. And then once we have that established, then we're going to be like, okay, so that's what a viburnum means. And now what makes it different from an invasive viburnum or non-native one, and then some of our native ones, and how do we tell the differences between them? I'm going to point it out. This is, again, another EcoQuest challenge species that we did, and I've got a fun little video for you on that as to how to tell apart the viburnums. Um, but just, just remember that a lot of the, it's the main thing you're going to be looking for is opposite leaf structure, and then sort of this, this really kind of hallmark shape to its flowers. And you might just see it right now. There's a lot of viburnums that are in bloom right now. But I'm going to start with this uh, EcoQuest challenge video for you guys as a, as a good sort of look as to what the vi how to tell apart viburnums from others. And, you know, me uh, being goofy teacher Brent here, um, hopefully you'll, it'll be memorable for you. <laughs> you may be wondering why I'm standing here with these three objects. I've got a diamond, a broccoli crowned and an umbrella. Well, the reason why is I'm going to teach you about our focal species in the month of June and also our EcoQuest challenge species, which are a class of plants called viburnums. And you can see them behind me. Um, this is a maple leaf viburnum, but I'll be teaching you about some of the differences, uh, how to tell some of the natives like the maple leaf viburnum behind me from the invasive shrubs. And the reason why I got this broccoli crown here is that the flower structures and flower clusters that you see in viburnums often resemble sort of this uh, either a dome shaped uh, group of florets or a more like flat top cluster of those flowers. And then the reason why I've got the umbrella here is that 
actually the technical term for some of the flower clusters on viburnums are called umble like flower structures in which you've got these long stalks just for the record on the first take of that when i opened the umbrella i stabbed myself in the eye i did it right the second time <laughs> that are that originate from one central point and kind of form either this like dome shape of a umbrella or flat top like the diamond that i'm holding here so we'll take a look at some of the uh, features up close as to how to tell some of the invasives from the native lookalikes and we'll learn a little bit about it and make sure that you're posting your observations of these viburnums on iNaturalist through our ecoquest challenge Here's a closer look at the flat top clusters of the maple leaf fiber. Okay, so just for the record, this is a native. This is a native one, but this is probably the one I see the most out in the forest. So while you're out surveying, you're probably gonna see a lot of maple leaf viburnum and that's a good sign, they are a native. Viburnum, and you see how each of those stalks is coming off and um, originating from a common point and then kind of branching out to create this flat top cluster. And you could, if you take a closer look at each of those individual flowers, you'll see the, the clear white petals. And a lot of the viburnums will have a whitish uh, color to them, or maybe a little bit of a pinkish hue. And the reason why it's called a maple leaf viburnum or one of our natives is because it looks like a maple leaf. In fact, almost very similar to a red maple leaf where you've got the three main lobes. So remember that red maples have the smaller leaves, three lobes. It looks almost identical to that, right? The other common feature of, of the viburnums is you've got opposite leaf arrangement on it. So you can see that the leaves coming off the, off the branches have an opposite uh, structure, meaning that the leaves are coming out opposite of one another, almost 180 degrees off of the main stem. But this is a uh, you know, good look at a maple leaf viburnum, a nice native that you can see growing around here and producing this nice white showy flower this time of year. And this was like early June, late May. So you may see that out and blooming right now. Um, then I want to juxtapose that. So just the other day, I was out with my family. I was going for a walk, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and I was like, "I think that's, I think that's one of the invasive viburnums." So I actually am going to show you this moment where I was literally just walking, just like you'll be walking. And then how do you actually kind of like determine what 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 viburnum you're looking at, and how to tease that apart from the rest of what you're seeing along that hike? So I got a lot of windows open here. Give me a second. Let me close this one. And this is what I saw the other day. The first one of these is called Linden Viburnum, L-I-N-D-E-N. -E All right, and this is how I noticed it from the rest. So that just gave you a basic idea of what, how viburnums are classified. Now let's take a look at what it looks like um, in Trailside. Here I am Trailside, just going along for a hike. And all of a sudden I saw this Trailside. And this is a look at what Linden Viburnum looks like trail side. And the reason why I stopped as I was walking for a couple of different reasons. So first of all, notice the opposite leaf structure. This is a hallmark of the Viburnums itself. And I also noticed sort of that those scalloped edges to these leaves. So again, it's coming out opposite of one another. You can see all throughout this, um, this shrub here. So kind of that opposite leaf structure and then the scalloped margins. As I zoom in closer, you see how I don't know why it keeps doing you know, that. Each of those veins is kind of coming to a point. You can really see that on, on the underside here. And using my, my thumb as a frame of reference, you see how each of those points are coming to. And, and again, look at that detail of that uh, veneer. So what I like, uh, it's often described as having scalloped edges. So if you've ever seen a scallop shell, it kind of has that like almost like wavy look that comes to a point at the end on the underside of the leaf and then of course you know again looking for that opposite leaf structure and as i'm touching this man i know for sure it's linden viburnum there is nothing like this feel of this soft like linen and that's a great way of remembering it soft linen linden viburnum it's got it's very like kind of soft fuzzy hairy unlike anything else that you'll you'll find along here so again so there's my mnemonic for you. This is my teaching mnemonic is like linden linen. It's it's like it's like fuzzy soft. It, it's crazy. It's it's just uh, it, it's so like supple and kind of like fuzzy.
And as I zoom out, just be looking for that opposite leaf arrangement, sort of the scallop look to um, to the leaves as well. And man, there is no mistaking uh, Linden Viburnum when you touch the leaves. Very, very soft and unlike anything else you might see here. The only other thing to, that I, I should note is just like, just take a look at the base and, and how it might be growing trail side. You can see multiple stems coming out from this and kind of coming up and uh, looking for the branches and, and the scalloped edge, soft, soft leaves. You got it. Linden Viburnum. Right next to the Linden Viburnum that I had on the opposite side of the trail, you can see that the flower buds are starting to appear. So this is literally across the, across from me on the trail where I was. And you can see that the, it's just starting. This is what it's going to look like. I mean, I did this like last week. So you're going to start to see that like those humble like clusters that are starting to form. And eventually this is going to flower. And these are actually more mature leaves. You see how it's got even more of a scalloped edge to it? So this is what it's going to look like this time here, of year. Here, and you can see where they're coming out. So again, that opposite leaf structure. And you see how it's coming out at the junction of that? And you see how it almost looks like an upside down umbrella. Or, and, yeah. and, and the way that the, the leaves are going to come out of the, or excuse me, the, uh, the flowers are going to come out of this. So again, at coming out of the base of where those two opposite leaves are coming, they're kind of like, uh, you know, fingers that you, that you hold up like this almost like a like an anemone or something pointing upward and that is another hallmark of the viburnums and the way that it that it flowers and again this is mid-may right now so there yeah so that's what it's going to look like i just wanted to give you another image because there is variation in nature but that was literally just across the way of the trail so now okay so that's that's linden viburnum um let's compare that with a native look-alike um in a second i just got to move something out of the way here uh, and then let's go to, what is it on my list here? I think it's this one. Just give me a second to find it. Okay, right here, I'm going to compare it to something that it does look like. And this is a native viburnum that that's, it, it resembles. And um, we'll, we'll get to how to tell the difference between them. This is on potted plants. Right here next to... The linden viburnum, the invasive linden viburnum, is a native called arrowwood viburnum. And you can see as they're next to each other why they would be confused for one another. Um, but again, linden, very soft. And as I'm feeling arrowwood, it just doesn't have that soft velvety feel to it. And you notice how the edges or margins of this they're much more deeply toothed. So I, I would call that dentate. So like the profile of your molars or something is deeply toothed and ridges, ridged here versus this is more of a scalloped appearance. And this is the native arrowwood. Then we see right here next to it in the linden viburnum. So with our native arrowwoods, you'll notice like much more deeply toothed margins of it and just doesn't have that soft hair or the more like scalloped edges of the linden viburnum. So those are one of the main differences. Also, if you take a look at the leaves of this, do you see all the holes that have been punctured in here? Well, that is actually caused by an invasive insect called the viburnum leaf beetle. This is what uh, Adrian was alluding to in the chat. So the natives, because the, the, it, I guess it's just because of uh, chemicals or just uh, Co-evolution, they tend to be chowed down on more by um, by bugs. This happens to be a, actually an invasive um, beetle that's come in and, and chewing on these leaves. And they tend to really just feed on the native viburnums like this arrowwood viburnum. And if you'll notice right next to it, you will not see these sort of like bullet holes in the invasive one. Another reason why these invasives have an edge over some of our native viburnum. So again, arrowwood does have a point and some of the lindens will have points as well, but really with the arrowwoods, you got deeply toothed margins and just doesn't have that soft velvety feel to it. Okay. So that's that's the only thing that um, that you might confuse it with is the, the native arrowwood looks very much like linden viburnum. The one I'm going to show you here, I don't have field video of, but I did have a potted uh, sample last year. Now, this one is going to be mainly obvious by its smell. Also, its leaf shape, but it's really the smell like it throughout the summer that is so distinctive. There is no doubt that you're looking at what is called Siebold's Viburnum, S-I-E-B-O-L-D. 
And I'll, I'll go back to the PowerPoint in a second so you can see all the, the spellings of all of this. But I just wanted to show you the field video of this and what Siebold's, the other invasive viburnum, looks like and particularly smells like. The last invasive viburnum to be looking for uh, during this month of June in our EcoQuest challenge is this one here. This is Siebold's viburnum. And you'll notice some of the key differences between the linden and the native arrowwoods that I just showed you. You see how the leaves of the Siebold's viburnum are much more elongated than what we are seeing over here with um, the arrowwoods and the linden viburnums, right? Much more elongated leaves, but honestly, what is the dead giveaway in this instance? And just remember that every the, the viburnums have opposite leaf arrangements. So that's your first clue, right? If you see opposite leaf arrangement on trail side, you have to stop yourself and be like, I got to look closer at that plant. This is the smell. You rub your fingers, even come up next to it burns rubber and is very, very strong. So elongated leaves, tooth margins, and a burnt rubber smell. And the way that I remember that, Seabold's viburnum, which is our invasive, Seabold's has a bold smell, just like our linden viburnum is soft like linen. All right, so those are your mnemonic devices to remember, folks. So let's get back to the PowerPoint. That's, that's it for the introduction to the viburnums and let's just summarize really quickly. So we've got the two invasive viburnums, that's linden and Siebold's. Linden viburnum has the scallop edges and is softly hairy on the surface. Um, the fruit of linden viburnum is a red berry. And that's again gonna come out of like born out of in flat top clusters and that's ripening in September. So unless you go out surveying much late in the season, you're not gonna see the berries. It's really gonna be the leaf. That's gonna be your cue. Siebold's viburnum, the leaves are much longer, much more elongated, like really deeply veined leaves to it, deep creases on it. The flowers and fruit, fruit are gonna be in a flat top cluster. So remember that diamond shaped flat top as opposed to the dome or broccoli shape to it. And again, the crushed leaf smells like it's very strong, like burnt rubber. It, it's unmistakable. You, you'll know what I'm talking about if you ever see it. Okay, and then we talked about arrowwood viburnum, the native, but that has more like deeply ridged edges to it, um, deeply toothed, not scalloped. Um, that will have round dark purple fruits, but I would not use the fruits to guide you in this because that those usually happen later in the year and won't be uh, out for you. So it's really kind of primarily about leaf shape. Um, you know, is going to be the differences, leaf shape, smell, that sort of stuff. Okay. Oh, oh, the other one. I forgot. There's one more that's blooming right now. It's called Blackhaw viburnum, and that's a that's a native. And Blackhaw viburnum is all it's blooming all over the place where I see it right now. Um, it's again, its leaves are opposite um, and simple. They have a white mid vein, and um, you know the the I I find that the Blackhaw viburnums have a little bit of a like a reddish hue to it. Um, and don't have like very soft leaves like lin like linen like linden does, um, and certainly does not smell. So you might see blackhaw viburnum. It kind of has a reddish tint to a lot of its leaves. So that's just another one that you may see that is blooming right now uh, all around me here in Dutchess County, New York. All right, and very like you can see that the two the the teeth on the edge are really really minute. Okay. So that is it for the viburnums. Let's move on to our next one. If I can get to it. Oh, wait, there's another one. I forgot about this one. The, I, I don't know, sometimes I confuse it with witch hazel, but the thing is, is like witch hazel does not have, it, like you see how like it kind of looks like a linden viburnum leaf, but witch hazel is alternating leaves. So remember, your first clue for the viburnums is opposite leaf structure with like the flowers coming from the middle of the opposite leaves. So even though like the leaf shape of witch hazel might look the same, it's, it's clearly alternating the uh, branches on it. But witch hazel is common in our forest, so I thought I'd point that out. Okay, now we really are moving on. <laughs> um, the next two that we're going to talk about now are privet and bush honeysuckle. And I put these two together because they also have like Opposite, have you noticing a pattern? Opposite leaves on these emerging plants is a clear, is usually a sign to pause. As you're walking along your trail and you see opposite leaf structure, you have to pause and look. 
That's my best advice for you for this whole webinar. Um, so privet and bush honeysuckle have opposite leaf arrangement and they have white flowers, which you could potentially confuse. So privet is, it was a common hedge plant. So is uh, bush honeysuckle. Now this is what I will say, bush honeysuckle is, is on the intermediate list, not because it's not common. Bush honeysuckle is super common in our area, but for whatever reason, historically, our volunteers had trouble identifying bush honeysuckle. We have three main species here. So we put it on the ISF intermediate list just because we were getting some misidentifications of it. So I'm gonna try to, to teach you how privet differs from bush honeysuckle so you don't make those same mistakes. So let's get right after it and we'll take a look at the differences between privet and bush honeysuckle and then we'll summarize in the, in the PowerPoint in a second. Just give me a second to, to find the right video here. I think it's, think it's this one, yep. All right, so I'll show you the differences between them. There is an invasive shrub called privet. And there's a couple of distinguishing features that uh, will distinguish it from other invasive shrubs in our area like uh, bush honeysuckle. But so let's key in on some of those key features here. Let's take a look at this branch. So this, this shows one of the main differences and one of the key features of privet. So first of all, let's take a look at the leaves. So the leaves themselves are coming off opposite. And we'll sh I'll show you in a second that sometimes it's not always directly opposite, but almost opposite that comes out. You see that the leaves are oval in shape and kind of come to a point at the very end. And in some um, types of privet that's even coming off like even even more so um, and you can see that it's there's a slight offset in the leaf stalks which is kind of you can kind of see that here you see how it's a little bit diagonal and I'll point that out in a second too kind of a distinguishing feature of privet um, but the main feature that I want you to really cue in on here is where this flower is going to be growing and the fruits on privets grow from the edges or ends of the branches that's actually going to be very different than another invasive shrub if you have to write one thing down write that down is that the privets have the flowering structure growing off the edges of of the branches that is the main thing. When this is gonna be a, eventually a white flower and the fruits are gonna be the same thing. They only grow off the edges of the branches. And that's, that, that's the thing that's gonna distinguish it from honeysuckle, like without, without a doubt. Called uh, bush honeysuckle in which they kind of grow in pairs right at the base of the leaf stalk. So privets have the flower and fruit growth come from the ends of the branches, as you can see here. And again, uh, very similar, you know, you got the um, opposite leaves or nearly opposite leaves. Um, you can see that that's even more obvious as I kind of zoom down here to this one, this version of privet. You can see how they're almost like slightly offset from one another, um, that opposite leaf structure of the privets. If we take a look at bush honeysuckle in comparison, you'll notice a few things. So here is a type of bush honeysuckle. You'll the honeysuckles are in bloom near me and I'm gonna show you one that's in bloom in a second, but you'll notice that the flowers are gonna come in pairs and they're not just on the edge of the branches. If this was privet, the flowers would only be at the edge of this branch, but you can see with honeysuckles, they're right in between every single opposite leaf see that the flowers are about to be coming out um, at the base of the leaf stalk and they'll come out in pairs and that's like a key identifying feature also with some of the bush honeysuckles you'll see how there's a little bit of fuzz on the stems so um, that's another feature that I look for when I'm looking for bush honeysuckles so these are just like some of the main differences again let's take a look back at privet all right, so you've got some really dense leaf. Uh, a privet tends to have like denser amount of leaves as well. Let me just zoom ahead here so that I can show you, I think just what honeysuckle looks like. Yeah, there it is. When it's actually flowering. Okay. I wanted to point out the flowers of honeysuckle and you can see that even on the same plants, you can see there's a quite a variation uh, between yellowish and whitish flowers. They are tubular flowers. Um, they almost look like a banana peel or something like being peeled back to me oftentimes. Um, honeysuckles are known for their 
for their nice scents, but I just wanted to zoom in closer and you can see that they're all growing in pairs um, along the opposite leaf structure, right? So there's the leaves coming off and even within it, uh, there's like two pairs coming off there and then two pairs coming off at the bottom. Um, and you can see where they're attached and coming off those opposite leaves. The only other thing I wanted to point out about bush honeysuckle is to me, the, um, the base or um, you know, the stems of these are actually pretty distinctive to me. They're, they're almost like striped in appearance and I can recognize them. Um, I have a lot of them near my property here in Dutchess County and almost this like striped appearance to it. Uh, it's sort of a giveaway to me that I'm- You see how it's got like some striping up and down along the stem? Um, so if this is ever pruned back or whatever, just just look for that. It, it's, it's clearly striped and Th that's just another feature and I'm going to show you um, I'd also recommend I don't I don't have them with me but um, especially when I get into the vines if you're doing an intermediate survey I highly recommend bringing out just like hand pruners with you because sometimes looking at the pith or the inside like twinkie filling of them can be very helpful so I would bring like put in your bag to bring with you along with your water and other gear that you're bringing bring in like hand pruners uh, because the pith can actually be really helpful as a distinctive feature. So I want to get it, like, I just want to go back to the PowerPoint to show you again. So bush honeysuckle is, there's a couple of different species. I think there's three of the three main ones in our region, but they, they hybridize a lot with each other. So it's, so we don't actually, you don't have to determine which of the three species it is that you're looking at. You only need to say that's bush honeysuckle. They have very simple oval shaped or egg shaped leaves. If you remember Japanese honeysuckle, right guys, that was on the standard list. So this is no different. It just happens to be growing like a bush. And the way that I think of its, of its leaves are almost like, um, they're like a little airplane propellers or something. They're oval shaped. And imagine this being like a propeller whipping around or something as, a, as like an airplane propeller, very similar to Japanese honeysuckle. And also, and just like Japanese honeysuckle, the stems or the, the more like, um, I don't know, the, the more flexible parts of, of, of the branches or whatever, they have the reddish stems to it. And they're pretty widespread throughout our region. Um, you may see red berries that come in pairs. That's gonna be again, later in the season. Right now, if you went out tomorrow, you definitely would see these uh, tubular uh, five lobe petals. Again, like an unpeeled banana. And the last thing I wanted to point out is if you did cut into bush honeysuckle, this is another distinctive feature is that it's pith or the inner Twinkie fill, filling is hollow. So if you cut into the side, you would, it would be like looking through a, through a scope or something through your eye. So hollow pith, that's pretty unique. And this kind of the striped stems. Privets on the other hand, they have very, very dense leaf structures. They are, do have oval leaves. They tend to be a little bit denser, but it's really the main difference is gonna be that the flowers are growing on the tips of the branches. There's not, see how there's no flower cluster in between like it would be in honeysuckle. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's the difference between honeysuckles and privets. And then our last, I think this is our last shrub, unless I'm mistaken, is going to be black jet bead. So black jet bead is pretty rare in our region, but in, in certain areas, it is like the whole forest understory. So that's what we're trying to avoid and making sure that we know about where the infestation sites are. We've got a really good bead on that, we think. Our crew is actively working on jet bead in certain areas. So it's really important for you to let us know if you happen to see black jet bead other than the places where we know about it. This is again, another multi-stem deciduous shrub. It can grow to be fairly, you know, fairly high, about six feet high. And right now is as at its, one of its most conspicuous. It's got very white showy flowers and that you may be seeing right now. It's towards the end of where it's blooming, late April and May. So you may still see these flowers on it. It's a member of the rose family. It was brought here as an ornamental and has, and has escaped. And I'm telling you the places where it is, it's like the whole understory. So we want to avoid that in our, in our area. So I want to show, this was again, was another EcoQuest challenge species. And I've got a good um, ID video for you on this. It's called black jet bead or just simply jet bead. Let's take a closer look. So here's a look at jet bead um, and kind of its sprawling nature. As you can see where I am in, the, in this park, 
um, you can see, just take a look for those white flowers that are popping out here. It's all, it's sprawled all along this area. And, and it's usually found in forest edges like this. If we take a closer look, we'll take, we'll see some of its key identifying features that uh, make it pretty prominent and distinguishable from some of the other shrubs in our region. So first of all, as you can see, are its berries. So the berries grow in a very unique fashion. You can see that there's four dark berries that grow almost perpendicular to one another. Um, and these usually come out in the late fall, but these have persisted and that's part of the reason why. So again, these persistent berries, you're noticing another theme, invasive, and invasive plants in general are hardy. And a lot of them have very persistent berries. They're made to withstand weather and conditions and they stay out like, so even though these don't come out till later in the survey season, you may still see them. Like I filmed this, I think last, last April and now they were looking pretty robust berries uh, and that was over winter that it survived like that why it's um troublesome as an invasive is that you've got these very persistent berries birds will eat them and then widely disperse them and then right next to it you can see its flower so it starts flowering in spring so again uh, late april or may that you'll start to see that and it's just uh you know this white uh, white flower. They don't. They don't grow in clusters. So you'll just see this one prominent flower in between a couple of leaves, and the leaves grow opposite of one another, as you can see. So like they come out right next to one another. Um, the other key distinguishing feature are its leaves. So if you take a look, see how the leaves are very toothed. All right. So and then they're very deeply veined. That's another key characteristic. And if you look at the top of this leaf you'll see that it's got like sort of an, uh, it's very elongated towards the top of my camera. I know it's like sort of hard to, it's hard to see, but like if you actually felt it, though the, it's such a deep vein. It's like a really, like someone etched it in there. It's a really deep groove on this and it feels like really robust and, and strong. And it comes to a point, like an elongated point. All of those are hallmark features in addition to the showy flowers. I'm gonna focus here. So you see that like sort of elongated tip. That's another key feature as well as the, the toothed margins. It's not quite as deeply toothed as some of the lookalikes, say like, a, like an arrowwood viburnum. Uh, people often confuse. You shouldn't confuse it with arrowwood viburnum anymore, right? Because the flowers look so different. It does not have the broccoli or flat top shape to it. This is very, this is like a showy ornamental flower to it, right? So you shouldn't confuse it with the viburnums anymore. Um, you, you should have a good bead on that. And what a viburnum, how it's classified in those umble like clusters, right? Of the like umbrella, whatever shape to it. All right, so that is black jet bead. It's really like the fruits that ends that that distinctive leaf shape that are going to make it um, have its key features. You're looking at oppositely branched leaves with notably ribbed veins. The white flowers should be still out, but the they you won't see those soon unless you go in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you know those kind of white showy flowers to it, and the berries that might persist. Those sort of like perpendicular black berries on it. So that's that's it for black jet bee. Um, the only other thing you may confuse it with are like elms or birches, just because it has like sort of they kind of come to a point or something. And sometimes the young saplings of these trees can be sort of confusing. Is that a shrub or is it just a young sapling of a tree? But but um, unlike a lot of our invasive plants, elms and birches, they have alternate branching. And most of what we're talking about today is opposite branching. Okay. So onto the vines, there's actually quite a few vines that are on our list because vines, once they take over, can be quite persistent and problematic. So let's take a look at the first of our vines, which are really obvious right now. If you have it in your area, you know what this looks like. The invasive wisterias are, uh, quite frankly, I mean, a lot of the invasives are here for a reason. They were brought here because they're beautiful. Wisteria has beautiful flowers. I don't think you can argue against that, but they are like entangling a lot of our native trees. They're taking them down. They have a really like, uh, in areas where wisteria has taken over, they are, they are like downing trees and girdling trees. Um, so, you know, the leaflets, um, uh, this is a compound leaf. The leaflets are very wavy. Um, they have a terminal or end leaflet. So think about compound leaves. Remember we talked about like back in the day about pinnate or feather-like compound leaves. 
There's a lot of symmetry going on here between the leaflets, but it has a terminal leaflet. It's this odd one coming out of the end. But really what right, right now, there's unmistakable is the flowers. So again, this was another EcoQuest challenge species for us. So I'm gonna show you a video of how to ID it in the field uh, and how, how it's different from other purple flowers that you might be seeing right now. Uh, and there is a native wisteria though. It's extremely, extremely rare. There's two types of invasives. You don't need to tell the difference, just you need to code it as wisteria. But just so you know, there's a Japanese wisteria and a Chinese wisteria. And there's kind of a cool way to tell the difference between them that I'll show you in this field video. At some of the key features, here we can see a closer look at the clusters of flowers of wisteria. They almost dangle off the plant itself, almost like grapes will cluster together and dangle off of a grapevine. Well, this is uh, the See, like if you think about a grapes you would get at the at the store, it's it's definitely dangling in that structure. Very dangly flowers. Wisteria flowers kind of have that very similar appearance. And I wanted to zoom in on the vine itself. You see how it's wrapping around this oak tree here. And you notice like from my finger, how it's twining from the bottom left up. Okay, so pay close attention to this. You again, let me just say, you do not need to know the difference between Japanese and Chinese wisteria for the purposes of this survey. But just for your own education and interest, it's kind of cool if you want to know the difference. It has to do with the way it's wrapping around the tree. And it depends on whether it's going from bottom left to upper right, or is it going this way, like across the other way? And this is the way to tell the difference. Right. And that is actually means when it's twining in that direction, bottom left to upper right, that it is Chinese wisteria. If it happened to be twining up whatever tree or shrub or whatever is climbing up in this direction, so from bottom right to upper left, then it would be the Japanese species or Japanese wisteria. So that's just kind of a, a cool difference between the two types of invasives. I, like, I, so the way that I remember that is like, you know how if you did a, like, imagine doing a check mark, like look at me on the screen, don't look at like the video right now. Like if you did a check mark with your pen, it would be up like this, right? Bottom left to right. So check Chinese, check Chinese. That's just one way I, I can remember it. It's just like the, your, your motion up. Uh, species that we have in our region of wisteria and just a really closer look at those dangling flower clusters. Now we'll take a look at the leaves. So wisteria has a compound leaf structure and is pinnately compound. And if you can take a look at this, um, in terms of the leaflets coming off, you'll notice that they're coming off opposite of one another. And if, I, if you zoom in really close, you can see that there's a little bit of fine hairs on each of the edges. Um, and it really comes to a point. As these leaves mature, you'll start to notice, you can kind of see it from the side angle here, that there's a wavy appearance to each of those leaflets. So that's another key way to look at it, a kind of wavy compounds leaf that the leaflets have this like a little bit of a- Adrian had pointed out that it looked, it's like a wavy, like, ri like Lay's potato chip or like Ridge's potato chip or something. It has a potato chippy look to it. It's very wavy. Wave to them. Um, and you can tell that it's compound. You look for where the bud is and the new bud on the next year. If this will zoom in on my finger here. Well, the new buds are actually towards the base of this. And then up now you can see it in, in the background where the new buds are growing. And, you know, just again, this wavy like appearance to each of the leaflets. And it holds that weird color. It's almost like, a, like I said, it's got some kind of tint to it, like a like a purplish tint or something. Like what you're seeing is is... Is, is kind of how With, it looks. Uh, it's fine not just like on it, especially when really it's green. Like this. So that's just some of the other key features. And again, just taking a look at the flower cluster. So looking, see how it's got a little bit of a tint to it. Um, and I'll show you some pictures in a second, but that's, that's wisteria. It's unmistakable flowers. It really is. But after the flowers are gone, you can really ID it by the leaves itself. That big compound leaf, kind of a wavy appearance to it and kind of like an off tint, like a little off green color. So let's take a look at uh, the differences between that and there is a native wisteria. I can almost virtually guarantee you're not gonna find it. It's very, very rare, but just so, you, just so you know, the native wisteria grows more like a shrub versus like if you're seeing the vines of wisteria up in a tree 
and it's wrapping around a tree, it is not native wisteria. It does not do that. It grows as a, it grows kind of as a shrub. And you'll see that the, um, the flowers don't have that dangling appearance to it. It looks more like a, like a compressed pine cone. You see how this looks more like a pine cone shape than this dangling structure? That's the, that's the main difference between the native and the invasive wisterias. All right, and again, Japanese versus Chinese. Remember, like if I just did a check mark, choop, check Chinese, and then the opposite way, you don't make a check mark in that direction, right? So um, that's that's the Japanese wisteria. Okay, I, I guess you could confuse it with bittersweet, but everyone who was on this call, you know, you've you've done the standard species. You should know what bittersweet looks like. It, its leaves don't look anything like wisteria. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this has like you know, two edges to it, it's alternate arrangement. So, and, and you know, it, it does corkscrew, I guess, like wisteria does, just like bittersweet does, but there, there's no other similarities really. Okay, you guys ready for the next one? We're rounding the final turn here, guys. Um, I'm going to talk to you about native grapevines and how to tell the difference between that and invasive porcelain berry. So, this is just like, these are three photos of grapevines. I'm gonna use that term very, very loosely right now, Va grapevines. It's really, really hard to go on leaf shape alone as to whether you're looking at a native grape or invasive porcelain berry. Generally, invasive porcelain berry will have skinnier lobes to it and kind of deeper lobes like you, like you see here, but you cannot go on that alone. And I'll, I'll explain that in the field ID video. If you go out in the fall, there it's a no-brainer. You're absolutely going to be able to identify porcelain berry because it has these unbelievably distinctive robin's eggs fruit on it. They're like pastel colored, they're speckled. There's absolutely no doubt at all, like whether you're looking at porcelain berry or native grape. There's no native grapes that have this pastel-y, speckled robin egg look to it, okay? But unfortunately, you're not going to have that cue and you're just going to be seeing vines that look like this and you're like, what the heck am I looking at? Is that native grapes or not? And you're not going to have the fruit as a key. So I'm going to show you a video as to how to tell the difference. And this is where your pruners come in handy as well. So why don't I take you out to the field and I will show you what I took, a video that I took um, just uh, earlier this week. So you know what you're going to be up against here. So I think. I think this is the right video. Let's get to the end of the viburnums. Okay, this might be the end of the viburnums, then it's gonna get into the grapevines. In viburnum. Here's a look at a heaping mess of grapevines in this huge pile here. But the question that we're after today is, is really, is it a native grapevine that we're looking at here? or is it invasive porcelain berry? Now, this is really obvious to tell the difference between it in the fall because, you know, porcelain berry has those really distinctive speckled fruit of the pastel colors of, of pinks and purples. But when we're looking at this in the early growing season of the spring, it becomes much more difficult. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at it and show you a few features to tell the difference between them. So first of all, leaf shape is not really probably the best way to look. So I'm holding the leaf here, but leaf shapes for native and invasive porcelain berry, uh, they, they vary quite a bit. So um, let's not use that as our main feature. But if, I, if we look at the inflorescences and the fruit that's coming out of this, one way we can tell as to whether we're looking at invasive porcelain berry or native grapes is by the way that that is. See the clusters here that are coming out of that? You see how it's dangling like grapes would dangle? So both its fruit and its flowers in native grapes are going to dangle like, like grapes you would get at the store. So porcelain berry does not do that. Do you remember my description of what um, viburnums, that umble like clusters? So porcelain berry, its flowers and its fruit have that sort of like umble like look to it, like the viburnums do. Our native grapes have dangling inflorescent flowers and fruit. Is dangling. You see how it's like 
the, a kind of a more dangled, elongated structure to it. Well, that's how we know it's native grape and not invasive porcelain berry. Because if it, if this was import, uh, invasive porcelain berry, the the um, the flowers, the clusters, the inflorescences, and the fruit would be appearing like this, almost like an anemone upwards, where it's uh, like a like kind of got an umbel shape to it. So you've got a base at the base of my palm, and then the porcelain berries and the and the flowers would be up like facing up and you see how these grapes are dangling here so that's one way to know that what we are looking at all throughout this tangled heap is actually native grapes and not porcelain berry now if you want to know for absolute certain this is what you have to do take out some shears and some clippers okay and then go to one of these vines so i'm going to show you i'm going to cut this in a certain place here along this vine okay so i'm going to do a little snip okay now, that part that I snipped down here, you're going to look at what is called the pith of that. So if you can see in this video, or I'm holding my hand. So does everyone see the color there? That's brown. Hopefully that's clear on your screen. But this part in the center, that is, is brown on native grapes. So that is, that is key. If you want to know for certain, that's the way to do it. The pith is sort of like the inner filling or inner twinkie of this. Well, in native grapes, you're going to see that that color is brown. It's very distinctive. So you've got that kind of greenish look on the outside, but right in the middle. And I'd recommend cutting on something with some thickness to it. Some of the younger ones, it's harder to see the pith. So find something that your um, clippers can cut through, but like on the, on the larger end of it of that vine it is going to be a brownish color and native grapes have that porcelain berry as i'll show you in a second has a white pith the other way that you know that you're looking at a um a native grapes although it's it's tougher when it's younger like this is that grape vines tend to peel so if i look at this at this down here this part of the grapevine you, you see how that part is coming off there i can just peel that right off and uh, especially as they mature, it's just flaking off. It, it, it's like uh, Tarzan vines that's like flaking off. See how it's easily peeled back? It's almost just like, I mean, I can just really, really peel this off. Well, with porcelain berry, um, you can't really do that with the bark. It doesn't peel off easily. You can see all my fingers kind of just peeling back this bark. You see how it's just flaking off as I go? Porcelain berry, the bark is going to adhere much tighter to it and, I'll, and have more obvious lenticels on it. So these are the ways, this is again, is our native grapes that we are looking at. There's a lot of different species of native grapes in our area, but they will share that common uh, characteristic of the, of the dangling fruits and um, dangling flowers, um, as well as the pith. You really got to look for the pith. All right, I'm taking this portion of the video on the same day as I just uh, as the native grapes that I just showed you there. So um, again, you know, leaves are not the best way to tell the difference between, say, porcelain berry and native grapes, but it can be your first clue. So let's take a look at this leaf shape. This is invasive porcelain berry here. I have noticed that a lot of the porcelain berry that we see has kind of narrower lobes. You see how they're really, really deep there where my finger is coming through? So much deeper lobes than a lot of the native grapes, and sometimes it's divided into kind of five skinnier lobes, and as this leaf grows out, it they you know it'll become like almost even skinnier and deeper as it grows out porcelain berry will have green uh eventually eventually it's going to lose that redness that you're seeing that's only doing that again this was earlier this week it's only doing that in our area because it's just first starting to grow but eventually the green you're going to have a green uh uh oh, like upper part of the leaf and a green underside upper side of the leaf as well as green underside especially as this matures it'll be green on both sides some of the native grapes not all though some of the native grapes will have white undersides but porcelain berry will always have green on both sides um i also wanted to point out that you know that you're looking at um grapevines both invasive and native because of these i should have pointed this out in the first part of the video but th this is amazing these structures i've made uh if anyone is an artist here someone please make something cool out of these tendrils because they're so neat they're like coy they're like it's amazing what nature is capable of isn't it i mean look at these it almost looks man-made it's just really really cool um but that's not that porcelain berry doesn't have isn't the only thing that has that native grapes also have these tendrils as well 
tendrils. Look at these curlicues that they have. Isn't that cool? It almost looks like man-made coils or something. So that's how you know you're looking at grapes and not some other kind of vine that has those like kind of really cool looking coils. But the only way you can tell invasive porcelain berry, again, you can kind of use leaf shape as a cue, but it's not the end all be all, is to really look at the pith. And remember with native grapevines, it was a brown pith. But as we look at this one here, you see how the center. All right. So you see how there's no brown dot in the middle? That's just all white. It takes up most of that area. It's just white. So that's that's the way to like absolutely know. Uh, the only other thing I'll point out here is um, is that uh, it does uh, as it, especially as it matures, porcelain berry will have lenticels on it. And remember, as the grapevines mature, they become flakier and flakier. Versus as porcelain berry matures, it becomes like the lenticels become more obvious. All right. So I don't know what else to say about that. I think I was pretty thorough there. Uh, that's, that's, that's the difference between porcelain berry. Um, again, held the, the berries are going to be held erect, uh, but you will not see those berries till really late in the season. Um, lenticels, bumpier uh, structure on its bark. Um, this is what the growth pattern will look like. So it grows in, in areas just like Oriental Bittersweet does. It can completely, blan completely blanket and cover uh, trees, shrubs. It, it, it does not discriminate. Um, and in certain areas, especially if you are surveying in New Jersey, porcelain berry is really, really bad. If you are surveying in what, where I live, up in Dutchess County or something, it's actually porcelain berry is super rare. So here's a species that you would say like, why is this on the intermediate list? I, don't, I see it everywhere if you're in New Jersey, but here in New York, there, it's actually not that prevalent, um, especially in northern, northern parts of our prism region. So that's a reason why we have it on the list. And plus it's hard to tell from native grapes, unless you're experienced. So again, I think I, I, think I did it justice as to what the native grapes look like, but just for the sake of this presentation, if someone's viewing the tape version, I wanted to at least have this slide up to show the difference. Okay. On to our last vine, and then we have one more herbaceous plant. So two species left, guys. So this, uh, there's a couple of different swallow warts that you may come across, but the one that's uh, more common in our area is called black swallow wart. This is an herbaceous twining vine. And again, herbaceous means non-woody. So it's got very flexible stems. There's no like main solid bark on it. Um, the main things that I'm going to point out about it or it has very, very dark, like much, much darker leaves, dark, glossy, shiny, pointed leaves relative to the rest of the kind of weeds or things that you might see along it. And right now, uh, uh, through the next couple of weeks, you'll start to see these star-shaped flowers that are coming out. Um, I, I know that they are happening in our region. Not all of them have bloomed yet, but that's definitely something to be on the lookout for. And they also have in later in the year, long green seed pods that look exactly like milkweed pods. Um, this is what it looks like when it smothers the forest floor. It is a tangled, tangled mess. And I will show this in the field ID video in a second, but you notice how dark those leaves are relative to the rest of the things around it. So, and it, it tends to like wrap around itself so if you looked at this, it would be really hard to tell. So, um, but, I, but I'll try to point out in the field ID, ID video, other things to be on the lookout for. This is really obvious. It's seed pods, uh, certainly resemble milkweed and contain wind dispersed seeds, just like milkweeds do. And this is why it's such a notorious invader because not only is it out competing native plants in the forest understory, just simply for nutrients and space and it's a twining vine and it's taking up, uh, taking up space relative to other plants. Here's, here's the real rub, um, is that it also is tricking our wonderful monarch butterflies that are making their way up here um, during their migration. It's actually tricking them into thinking that it's milkweed. And that's because milkweed has very, very similar pods to it. It also milkweed has um, star-shaped flowers, just like the swallowwort does. So these, there's many different uh, species of milkweed that the monarch caterpillars require to complete their life cycle. So what's, what's happening is that monarch butterflies are making their migration. They're, the females are looking for places to lay their eggs. Well, 
a lot of the, the milkweeds that they're looking for have a certain chemical scent and a certain cue that these monarchs are queuing into. And what has ended up happening is that they're queuing into black swallowwort and they're laying their eggs on black swallowwort as well. But black swallowwort as a host plant is not viable for these monarch caterpillars. So they're laying their eggs on this invasive plant and the monarch caterpillars cannot develop on it. They cannot use that plant's nutrients to feed and to grow up. So not only is it outcompeting our milkweeds, but it's also stealing the eggs away from uh, monarch caterpillars and monarch butterflies. So it's a kind of a double whammy. So let me show you what it looks like in the field. Um, I've got some interesting field video for you here just to show you what it looks like um, in, uh, in the field uh, as during this time of year. This is a really weird video I took of it on a random like gravel part of a parking lot to show you how hardy it is. And then, I, and then I'll show you one in the forest. Here is a rare sighting of black swallowwort. Um, actually, uh, as I was walking in Dutchess County, I again, I didn't take this video intentionally. I was just walking around in a park and I saw it. It was like just growing in the middle of rocks, like literally in the middle of rocks. <laughs> saw this uh, popping up in the middle of some rocks and you can just see how hardy this is. You can see that like sort of, um, it looks like an elongated heart. You see how it comes to a very clear point and kind of is heart shaped, but it's very, very dark green. And you can see the flowers that are starting to form on this as well, that star-shaped flower. Darker leaves. And if I zoom in close to the flowers, if I can flip this around, you see how it's got That's those... a really good look at it. That's a really good look at the flower. One, two, three, four, five, five, five uh, pointed star. Star-shaped flowers to it and the black appearance. Um, again, this actually grows like a vine and over here you can see it almost like twisting around itself and it's just so interesting. I wanted to film this because you can see what sorts of conditions is capable of growing. It's literally just rocks here um, and as this continues to grow, you know, you will see um, that it will continue to sprawl out horizontally, continue to clamor over each other, but just like look at this landscape that it's growing in um, and just how hardy of a invasive that this is. So just wanted to point that out. Here in that same park is another look at black swallowwort and how it's growing. Um, you can see also just, uh, you know, you can see that it's, it's leaders that are coming up here. You see how there's space between the opposite leaves and then there's space or then there's opposite leaves, then space again. And just like a, like a lot of vines, like bittersweet, you know, when they're young, they have these leaders and they're looking to purchase on something. Black swallowwort doesn't like wrap around trees usually, like a lot of the vines do that climb up trees. This is like a horizontal sprawler. So this is just blanketing stuff on the forest floor. You're looking for purchase, it's kind of angled. Um, and again, just looking for those really like glossy, dark, dark leaves. You can see the difference between that and garlic mustard in the background, just how much darker the leaves are. That's one key characteristic to be looking for. But this just gives you a look at its growth pattern again. You see how it's wrapping around itself like Bittersweet likes to do? It just, it, it's like if you're in Swallowwort, I saw a comment in the, this is the other thing. If you find Swallowwort, you're either not going to find any Swallowwort or you're going to find a ton of it. And that's another reason why it's on the intermediate list. You'd be like, Brent, I don't understand. Like people are talking about it's like everywhere. And it's like, no, it's it's not everywhere. It's just that if it's if it's in a place, it tends to be very like it takes over. I mean, that's what it does, but it's not it's not everywhere throughout our region. It's actually certainly less common than it than a common invade uh, those on our standard list. So that's what um, swallowwort looks like. It does have another, there is another invasive version called uh, pale swallowwort with like um, different color flowers. It's like pinkish flowers, but that's super, super rare in this area. All right, here we are. Last one guys, herbaceous plants. And that is a kind of, an, uh, if some of you guys may have assignments that are not in the forest. And interestingly, we recently found this because of a surveyor who happened to find Chinese bush clover, not just in a meadow, but it was actually found in Harriman State Park. And this is why we need your help guys, because this is a species that is taking over meadows 
But if it's starting to creep now into forests, we need to know about it so that we can do something about it immediately. We found it in Harriman, and now we're now we're worried uh, that it's that it's uh, more widespread than we originally thought. So Chinese bush clover. Um, I'm going to show you in the video actually do a really detailed version of this that kind of goes through this. But essentially, you're looking for leaves that cluster together in groups of three and a little tiny pinpoint. Whoop, like at the ends, like you're pricking um, uh, like, like a glucose test or something, like a little prick at the end. Um, and white purple flowers on leaf axles. But again, that's blooming later in the summer that you probably are not gonna see it now. So you really have to go on leaf shape um, to determine this. And the best example I can give you of this is a field ID video. And you're gonna really get a good look at what it looks like and how, it is how it's taking over meadows now. Um, and this is very, very recent. It's still not very common, but it's, uh, we are very, very concerned about this species. Here's a look at a whole field of an invasive herbaceous plant uh, in our lower Hudson Prism region called Chinese bush clover. Chinese bush clover was brought over to the U.S. in 1899 uh, for erosion control and for slope stabilization as well as a livestock feed. But you can see it's expanded its distribution. It can grow in really, really dense. I'm going to say it in a second, but... I just want you to like pan your eyes across the screen right now and think about the color that you're seeing. It's got a whitish, silverish shade to it. And that's going to be your first clue like, whoa, I should take a closer look at that. Uh, clusters uh, basically out competing a lot of the native species that would be growing in meadows like the one I am in here. And you can see it's just a complete monoculture of Chinese bush clover. Um, one of the things that you can look for as you're walking through meadows to see if you see Chinese bush clover is sort of that silvery cast it gives off. You see how it's kind of has that ghost like appearance or silver whitish cast to it. That's because it's got hairy and silvery undersides to its leaves, which we'll take a closer look at in a second. If you look at the, this one that I'm holding here, it's about three feet off the ground. It's sort of strange, like when you look from a distance, how white it is. But then when you look, when you bring it close to you, it just it looks like green. Um, so just be mindful. Of it that. almost has like a remember in high school, you know, chemistry uh, test tube brush cleaners. It almost has that look to it. You see how the leaves are pointing up and almost like a, a test tube cleaner appearance to it. Um, it is really, really persistent and difficult to get rid of because it's got a the deep taproot system. Its seeds, as you can see some of them here, can also be um, viable in the soil for up to 20 years. So very, very persistent in the environment. And so makes early detection and reporting even that much more important. Or you get a situation like you see here, whole fields of Chinese bush clover just completely smothering out any native vegetation trying to grow. So let's take a closer look at some of the key characteristics that define this species and how it differs from some of its native lookalikes. Here's a closer look at the flowers of Chinese bush clover. And you can see that it's starting to have a yellowish appearance to it. Um, this is the end of September, but if you were at the- So you're probably, you're still gonna see the silvery bits right now, but you won't see these flowers. But I will point them out just so in case you go out later in late summer, you might see it. Uh, towards the end of August or so, you'd start to see that they're a little bit whiter, but now they're turning yellowish. And you can see at the middle, of that flower, it's a little bit of a purplish hue. So purplish at the center of that flower uh, petal um, and kind of turning a yellowish, especially as we get into the fall time here. And you can see some of the flowers in the background, that purple really jumping out at you as well. Here is a look at a leaf. This is it. This is what you're really gonna need for right now. So memorize this picture or whatever. It's like, do you see how this like cute little three leaves that are together and you see that this still image really shows that pinpoint very very clearly that's it that's that that's the main thing to to like laser focus on leaf of chinese bush clover now this whole thing that you're looking at right now is actually a leaf it's a compound leaf meaning that is broken down into three different leaflets and you can see that the middle leaflet is actually a little bit longer than the ones that are flanking it on either side here. So that's one key feature to look for. And the other one is if you look at 
the tips of the leaflets, right? You see how it's got a little pointed, bristled tip at the end? Well, a lot of the lookalikes, like slender bush clover, do not have that tip. Also, slender bush clover will have more purplish flowers than the flowers that I just showed you there, which are more primarily whitish or turn yellowish with a little bit of a purple center versus the slender bush clover has generally purpler, I guess you could say, flowers. And uh, it's really this like the tip of each of the leaflets that's really key. It's also important to notice that you see how long each of those leaf stalks are with some of the other lookalikes don't have that length. To I'm talking about this part right here. You see that? So here's the main stem with the stalks of, remember this whole thing is a leaf. That's a compound leaf, right? So this, the stalks of it are, are much, much longer. They're not like tightly hugging the main stem. Each of that leaf stalk. So you see the base where my thumb is there. It's a pretty extended leaf stalk to get to each of those leaflets there. You'll also notice that the leaves are coming off of the stem here. There, see how they're alternating? So they're not actually coming out opposite of one another, but they're alternating along the stem. So that's just another thing to look for. Each of the leaves are going to be slightly pointed upward and again, giving that sort of like that um, test to brush cleaner appearance to it, as you can see here. So just, just some key features and how to tell it apart from some of the lookalikes. All right, so that's Chinese bush clover. Um, again, in terms of, uh, you know, they're, they're mostly found in like sunny disturbed areas, meadows, utility corridors. Maybe your trail goes through like a utility corridor. I know a lot of trails in this area do do that roadsides, meadows, old fields. Um, it was planted as a conservation crop and this is what happens sometimes these intentional plantings, they just, it's just, be they become disastrous. So uh, just those are the things to be on the lookout for. Um, it's throughout New Jersey, but mostly to the South and there's very, very few reports of it in New York. I saw some things in the chat that we can address at the end of the talk and, and uh, I know some sightings and uh, it was troubling that we found it in Harriman. All right, uh, slender bush clover looks like this. Remember, it just has like, it's not like white flowers with a little bit of purple. Slender bush clover has like really like that. It's like one of the main uh, things is like the flowers are really, really obvious. Um, and again, uh, is lacking the uh, tips on the end. Um, you know, the, there's hairy lespedeza, which is a, a type of bush clover as well, but it's just, the leaves don't look anything like it. So that's, that's hard to compare it to. Um, and, you know, Korean clover, uh, again, just not at all like that, that uh, brush cleaner appearance to it. So um, I don't think you'll mistake it with anything, but just look for those uh, three leaflets with the uh, brush point at the end. That's it, guys. Essentially, you know, just like with the standard, like you're going to be able to develop a search image that works for you. You can use my mnemonic devices. You can use like all of these different cues for it, you know, these are gonna be less common. So you have to, you have to hang in there and just trust yourself that you're not seeing it. Um, you, sometimes you get in an area, you see it once and you'll see a lot of it. And then other times you're just not really gonna see it at all. So it's unlike the common ones. That's why we start our surveyors with the common ones because it kind of builds up your confidence. Like, oh, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing this repeatedly, right? But now you're at a level with the intermediate stuff where it's like, you have some experience, you kind of know the terms and, you know, um, you got to trust yourself. Like you, you guys are here for a reason. You've done a phenomenal job for us and are ready for that next step. Like have confidence in yourself. All right. Next steps. Um, I'm going to be in touch. Uh, if you want a refresher on the protocols, the protocols are not, are not going to be any different than they were last year, but it's always good to have a reminder. Like how do you use Avenza? How is the assignment going to come to you? How do I get that map into Avenza? Um, I'm having, uh, it's, it's going to be more or less like a repeat of last year's, but I'll, I'll try to keep it somewhat fresh and it'll be live and you'll be able to answer questions. That's happening on May 27th, 7 to 8.30 if you want to sign up for that. Um, it's not mandatory for returning surveyors. You can always watch a taped version of that and just watch the parts that you need to. But you're always, well, of course, you're welcome to come if you, if you want. Um, you can go to the events page to register from that. Um, and again, you're going to receive a full color field guide of all the species that are on our intermediate list. 
Um, I'm taping this right now, so you have full access to this webinar um, and any future webinars, including the protocol one. We always have our digital library with short uh, species spotlights. If you want to learn more about how these individual species are impacting the ecosystem, this, these webinars are very focused on ID, but we do have some species spotlights that talk about how is that impacting ecology and native plants. And of course, you have access to me for questions, guys. I'm always here, well, uh, willing to help and, and help you guys out. So if you do have questions, feel free to email us at invasives at nynjtc.org. You can email me personally at brent at nynjtc.org. I have a couple of different email addresses. They all get funneled into the same thing. So don't worry about like CCing me all my email addresses that you may have in your inbox. They all go to the same place. So uh, inv that's invasives, Brent, whatever. I'll get them all. So any way you have of contacting me is fine. Um, and, you know, just really excited to have you guys on board and to take on this extra challenge this year. And, um, you know, trust yourselves. I'm proud of you for being here and uh, look forward to another great season together. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording there and uh, willing to take questions now, wherever has them.